Thank you, everyone. So I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep it quick. And it's nice to see Tariq give two talks, and he was uh, before time. OK, so the report card of the industry, collectively speaking, is not great. The 2024 research report now shows that the first time silicon success has plummeted to 14 percent. So we are a former verification house at Aximai, so we obviously take a lot of pride in quality of verification and proofs. And we also kind of monitor what's going on in the industry and what kind of bugs are leaking to the silicon. So what I did eight years ago when I founded Aximize was to build a model where we could actually train engineers, do the actual work on large designs, <coughs> small designs, through our services and consulting engagements, and in many cases, build bespoke custom <coughs> solutions, Formalizer being one for RISC V, and last month we launched Footprint, which is for area analysis on silicon. So um, we are doing consulting and services at a very big scale. So uh, one billion gate designs are actually being put through model checkers and being verified through functional verification techniques powered by abstraction. So if you have any of these kind of designs, we are actually already verifying it or have verified it. And RISC-V is very much a part of our um, toolkit, as it, as it were, target toolkit. But let's talk about why is processor verification hard and why bugs escape to silicon. So it is my view, based on the work I've been doing on processors and other designs, that actually the holistic view of verification is never considered. And actually, the split between architecture and microarchitecture is so wide that people end up doing a lot of functional simulation on microarchitecture. And the architectural modeling is done with C++. And actually, the overlap is never fully understood. So in my work on RISC-V designs back in 2019, when I built the Formalizer first version, I noticed that actually the X bugs were causing lockstep to malfunction. Uh, it was introducing deadlocks. It was actually causing uh, security issues. So a lot of this work has been previously published in multiple conferences. I'll be happy to talk offline and give you more details. My point here is that formal methods today is capable of addressing all the way from architecture down to silicon. We are doing it, and we are doing it on, as I said, very large designs. And I would encourage more people to think that way. And the trouble with processors in particular is because you've got so many of these optimizations, um, you can never really be done done in verification terms until you consider the verification problem as a whole problem of functional power, performance area, safety, and security. <laughs> so especially if processors become anywhere close to the likes of what Tariq was showing, a uh, pretty complex superscalar CVA6 also is one, one of these uh, processor examples, you can actually very easily have bugs that can leak. And we built this uh, tool, our uh, formalizer, to actually focus on proofs and bugs, but also accelerate debug and provide you end-to-end -end coverage as well as reporting. What happens is we formalize the RISC-5 ISA specification, took this as formalized properties, which actually then get customized when you bring in your processor. And then they are both sent into a model checking tool, which then gives you a failure or it tells you that you have a proof. And you can use any formal verification tool you like. So for example, these are the results from about four years ago on the IBEX score, um, synopsis, mentor, cadence, and one spin have all been integrated. Uh, we've also actually tested Yosis. So do we find bugs? Actually, what is very insightful um, is that every time we take a processor which has been previously verified, we end up picking bugs. And actually, the Chariot IBEX is also an example of one such core, which we ended up uh, taking in September in our tool. And very quickly, we found some new bugs that were previously missed. I have some examples of that. Um, but also, we have looked at um, in-order and out-of-order cores. So this is CV32 U40P, this work we did in 2020 um, with the open hardware. These are all proofs that actually come out of Jasper uh, using our properties. This is CVA6, uh, and when the processors become bigger, the proof times do increase, but we are still able to get the results coming out. Let's take a look at some of the bugs. So this is a bug that I caught uh, some years ago on IBEX. The reason I still show this is how quickly it was caught. So this was when IBEX was cloned out of Zero Risky, with I think it was probably day one or day two and Philip Wagner asked me to test this. 
And all I did was to run the app on IBEX. Uh, I had no idea what IBEX was like. It compiled, and what happens here is that if the debug was initiated um, any time when the controller FSM is in the decoded state, the processor goes all over the place, it throws exception, and nothing actually works properly. So I thought it was, um, it was probably a problem with my test cases, but it turned out that actually it was a real bug and it impacted lots of instructions. Not a surprise, it's a new design, they've just cloned it, so actually the FSM uh, area where the bug was actually had a TBD to do and there were comments in there once we were debugging it. So actually it only took uh, seven cycles in formal to find it and Philip of course confirmed uh, later on that it was a bug. And my point is even though you may be making derivative designs and the processors may be small, you can actually save time by running formal as opposed to doing unit level testing. Because not only do we find a specific bug, we find all of the bugs in its vicinity. And that's the acceleration, the case for econ economics basically, to save money. So this is WAR5, previously verified by using clear rules for S5 formal. Uh, we found 30 bugs on that. This is a really nice juicy one. We found it in our work, but also later on uh, found in one of our customer projects. This is a very big design. It has an MMU. The addresses get uh, sent to caches for lookup, and if there is a miss, they get tracked in a miss buffer. And once the data comes back from memory, uh, it, the cache is refreshed. So what's going on here is you've got a load word for an address A that gets a miss, gets sent uh, uh, to the memory for a lookup. The memory sends the information back, and the responses are sent back. What is actually happening is many, many cycles later, you have a store to the same uh, address, but this is a bypass. It's actually going to overwrite uh, the address in memory, which it does, and it also ends up sending its responses back, and you can see the processor is receiving these. But actually, uh, in reality, because it's a bypass, or if it's an atomic, it's supposed to invalidate the cache line which it doesn't do in this case. So what happens is when you have a subsequent load many cycles later, it hits the cache, finds a valid data which actually isn't valid, and you see the problem. So one of our customers found this similar kind of bug, um, and then they had to do a lot of directed test cases to actually a, reproduce it, then once the bug was fixed, it was very difficult to prove uh, or convince even informally that the bug was fixed properly. So actually doing a read after write check uh, using load or store checks, you know, you can actually find these kind of bugs. Let's talk about Chariot IBEX. So as I said, we picked this up in September. Uh, a new engineer joined us, Ia, and very quickly within a couple of days of having understood what the Cherry spec was about, what the Cherry OT spec was about, we were able to find an issue uh, where we found that a load that was actually illegal that should have been squashed in the pipe uh, was actually sent to the memory and the data was brought back and it actually prevented all of the subsequent R-type instructions from working correctly. So we of course notified uh, the designers and actually what's interesting is that um, you know, because the designers had already verified it previously, so they weren't expecting this to see. Um, this was then fixed in the design, and then we uh, reran the checks, and actually the bug was fixed. Uh, but now the problem was that we were going deeper in the state space, and we encountered the bit manipulation instructions to be broken as well. So um, it's a very nice commentary on GitHub where you can actually see the designers explaining as to why this was missed and uh, subsequently the fix was, uh, fix was applied. This is a very interesting case of decoder where you were able to decode one instruction in two different ways. Um, initially designers were not convinced it was a genuine issue but we did persuade them to think about PPA and other security type issues. So they were also uh, fixed. We recently talked about Footprint in February. This is a great tool. This requires no formal verification experience, but you can throw your design in and it will tell you how much redundant area you have. So because this is a Cherry event, I wanted to tell you more about some of the redundancies that we have actually identified in the Cherry OT IBEX uh, literally last week. Um, so we have a way to actually characterize full utilization, partial utilization, or no utilization at all. 
So we can tell you if your FIFOs are partially full, if your counters are not counting fully. And this was my last slide, so I'll stop here. So to wrap it up, formal is great. And I think as we take Cherry to implementation uh, in more complex ways, formal would be the way to go. Thank you very much.